So there was a night before the first training that we did uh, in last April where we were kind of on the edge of our seats because we didn't really know what to expect. I mean, we were hoping that everybody had more or less arrived to the same conclusions on the exam routes that we gave them to assess that we previously assessed as well, of course. But until the moment that we just downloaded all the data and compared it with uh, with our reports, we, we were not sure. If... Welcome to Trail Effect. I am your host, Josh Blom. Trail Effect is a show that dives into the stories behind trails, the communities that embrace trails, and the people who rely on trails as a way of life. The goal of this show is to turn the stories you will hear from our guests into useful knowledge that can be applied to your community while providing some entertaining and inspirational content. Guests on Trail Effect include trail builders, board members, community leaders, volunteers, and regular people who really enjoy trails. For episode 178, we have Misha and Eduardo, the two masterminds behind the international trail rating system. Misha is based in Switzerland, and Eduardo is based in Italy. Both have a strong understanding about the nuance that goes into dissecting and rating a trail. While there is a lot that can go into how or why a trail is rated a certain way, this system is the most comprehensive approach I've seen for rating trails yet. Cooley Creative is the title sponsor for this episode. They design and build custom websites, as well as help companies with branding, photography, and e-commerce. Cooley Creative was started in Wisconsin, but is now based out of Bend, Oregon. Jared from Cooley Creative is a friend of mine. We've traveled together on multiple mountain bike trips, and sometimes he sends it. For more information about Cooley Creative, head on over to www.dojustsendit.com. Yes, that's right, www.dojustsendit will get you to the Cooley Creative website, so check it out. I would like to highlight another affiliate partner of the Trail Effects podcast, which is the Loam Pass. The Loam Pass is your one pass for 40 plus destination bike parks. When you purchase the Loam Pass, you get two days at each partner location, as well as an additional third day for half off. That means if you went on some epic road trip, you'd have over 80 days of access to some of the best bike parks, period. When you purchase your Loan Pass through the affiliate link found on the Trail Effect website or found in the show notes, you will receive free pass protection. Yes, that's right. Free pass protection. And you'll be supporting the Trail Effect podcast as well. Some of the 40 plus destinations include Ride Rock Creek, Ride Canuga, Angel Fire Bike Park, the Keweenaw Adventure Company, Chestnut Mountain Resort, Jared's Place, Spirit Mountain, Marquette Mountain, Burke Mountain. Howler Bike Park, and many more. So click on the link provided or the Loan Pass, support the Trail Effect Podcast, and get free pass protection. Thank you. Cattle Mountain Apparel, the brand that was built by travelers, hikers, trail runners, and mountain bikers, with the motto of Venture Far, Laugh Hard. While I definitely use Cattle Mountain Apparel for mountain biking, Cattle Mountain is also my go-to choice for daily wear as it is super functional and comfortable. Cattle Mountain Apparel also offers a lifetime gear repair program with the goal of extending the life of their products while reducing waste in the process. If you ever damage any of your apparel, Kettle Mountain will repair it for free for life. By using the affiliate link found in the show notes or on the Trail Effect website, a small commission will come back to the Trail Effect podcast, which helps to cover the cost of expenses for keeping this show going. Now on to the Trail Effect with Misha and Eduardo. Here we are today on Trail Effect. I have Misha come back and Eduardo. I am not going to try to pronounce your last name because I will butcher it, but it starts with an M. Misha <laughs> is based in Switzerland and Eduardo is based in Italy, correct? Yep. And so this is a two for one episode because we have both both Misha and Eduardo have different backgrounds, but they're also together on what we're going to refer to as the international trail, trail rating system, which I'm really excited that Misha re- reached out to me on this because I've been paying attention to this since I want to say July of 2023 when it first came on my radar. And it's a topic of conversation, I think, between mountain bikers and even other other sports too, like skiing and whatnot. You know, trail ratings sometimes can be objective or not objective, subjective based on people's opinions and maybe egos. You know, that, at least that's where I've, you know, kind of ran into the, the most, uh, we'll say, discussions on it. So this would be a, a great conversation and get get what's going on over in the European side of things and how it is truly international. So how's it going today, Misha and Nadordo? Very, very well. Thanks. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure 
to be here. Thank you, Josh, for, for the invitation. Uh, we've had a number of friends joining the podcast, so we're very happy to, to be here as well. Let's go to Misha first. Let's get your backstory about how you got into mountain biking, which obviously will lead us into the, the story about how, you know, wh where the international trail riding system came to be. Yeah, absolutely. Also from my side, thanks a lot, Josh, for, for having us. Um, yeah, I got into mountain biking back in 1991. Um, reason there was to get quicker to some mineral and crystal finding localities. I was a road cyclist before. Uh, quickly, I left the road cycle uh, in the garage and then just went into biking. Uh, seven years ago, I got certified as a Swiss cycling uh, mountain bike guide and instructor. So from there on, I was like on the professional side of biking. My other professional life started actually in the metals industry. I'm, uh, I've got a PhD in material science and worked in aluminum and uh, steel industry. But somehow I ended up in uh, management consulting. And the guiding experience and the consulting experience happened to bring me into a position to lead a project that's, that was initiated in Switzerland by the Swiss Bike Park to harmonize trail rating systems in Switzerland. Yeah, that was my starting point of that story. So I got a quick question before we go to Adorno. Have you ever worked in the metal side of things when it comes to mountain bike development? Unfortunately not. But when I started my studies, I had to do some workshop uh, practice and I just built some um, some V-brakes than myself and, and the front up. But that's, yeah, 30 years ago, so... <laughs> Yeah, that, that would be 30 years ago. Well, V-brakes were pretty revolutionary when they came out, to be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I still have one on, on an old hardtail, my first one, yeah. It, was, it works, but yeah. Yeah, when we went from straight cantilevers to V-brakes, that was a lot of power difference. Definitely. Let's get your backstory, Eduardo. You're in Italy, and you have a whole different background, I'm assuming. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I've been I've been through different uh, jobs over the years. So I've started uh, interior design and worked in an architect studio for a while, and then quickly realized that being indoors in front of a computer all day wasn't exactly the call of my life. So quickly changed the uh, direction, and always been mountain biking and cycling uh, till I would from like many many decades at this point well i'm not that old but uh, i was like 15 16 trying to enter races that i was too young to enter so from there i tried always to to bring the passion for cycling and mountain biking and uh, my other jobs so I worked as a bike mechanic as a photographer around bikes as much as i as i could uh, i work as a guide for an american company so mostly road cycling back then but it was uh, it was very uh, very interesting to see also all the side of uh, tourism and how people relate with how difficult the ride is, uh, how hard it is, and all of that stuff then became part of what I also do as a job, which is uh, being involved with uh, with IMBA and then with the ITRS as well. So it kind of uh, looking backwards, you see where all the different uh, expertise that I got in different jobs and different uh, perspectives of life were very helpful to get with Misha and then work on the ITRS. Well, I suppose between both of you guiding, you've probably heard all sorts of different stories regarding how someone might perceive a certain trail to be, which then leads us into the rest of this conversation, correct? Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. It's a topic that you, you touched on the topic of ego. And I think that's uh, something that very often comes very quickly into the discussion and i'm not so sure if it's like a southern european thing or if it happens in other countries but i'm pretty sure there's a a little bit of that in every in every mountain biker that you almost always want to kind of downplay how hard a trail is because oh i'm riding it so if i say it's easier than it is then i look badass but of course that's a little bit complicated when you start using that information to promote a destination to tourists or to beginners because at that point you kind of have to keep the ego and and your own uh, personal thoughts aside and try to be as objective as possible but it's not as always that that easy so i've got a quick story i've got a client in my professional world based in florida 
United States, Florida. Uh, maybe there's probably no other Florida. <laughs> it was the client, myself, and another person we had just met who was from the New England region of the United States. And we were riding a trail. And after we got done riding a trail, I'd asked both of them, since they were from two different places, they hadn't talked before 20 minutes before that, like we had just all met. And I said, we're all from different places. How would you all rate this trail? Person from New England was like, oh, that's a green trail. Like you could take a road bike on that thing. And I think that kind of took both myself and the guy from Florida back a little bit. But I then asked, would you take a brand new mountain biker on that trail? And, they, and that was what paused the rest of the conversation because it wasn't that. So with that story, let's get into the backstory around why the, why the international trail rating system was developed. And the start of it. And I think we'll, we'll start out with Misha first on that. So as explained, um, I, I personally was um, interested in that um, when we set up our own guiding company and how to describe to the customers uh, what skills they need to bring. And I used a system that is existing in the German speaking area. It's called the single trail scale because I liked it most. And so, so we, we worked with pictures and as good as possible descriptions to um, really tell people, hey, you should expect that kind of stuff. Then um, make a shortcut due to my professional background. I ended up in a position to be project manager for a project to harmonize trail rating systems in Switzerland. Because here in Europe, it's not like in North America that you have the Imba North America system that you all are super familiar with. We stopped it, stopped counting at more than 20 systems because we couldn't Google in every language. And we just Googled in maybe six, seven languages, and then we came to above 20 systems. Alone in Switzerland, frequently used minimum five systems. And some have the same colors, but a different definition behind it. Some are totally different. And there is this so-called Swiss bike park, which you have to envisage as a skill center. Like it's a couple of soccer fields big. There's no lift. It's, um, it's really a training center that was set up um, together with Swiss Cycling as a training ground publicly, but also for the for the athletes. And they have destination partners, means like in the Alps, Davos Klosters, for example. The idea was, hey, when you do skills courses, then the Swiss Bike Park, which is nearby a big city, nearby Bern, the capital, um, people should know which trails they can ride here in the Alps with us should be the same. And that's not the case. This is why they said, hey, we are publicly funded, this uh, Swiss bike park. They got funding by the Ministry of Economics. And they said, okay, we're going to work on that. And um, I got the project management role. This is how I started with the focus on Switzerland. But then very quickly, in checking out, okay, whom do I need to talk to? came across Eduardo because um, then I learned about Imba Europe and realized, hey, there's one guy there who was working on the same topic. And that was um, end of 2020, I think, yeah, when we, when we first met online. Let's get your backstory, Eduardo, and, and to the foray into when you and Misha connected. So if I have to look back, I think that everything started kind of uh, – way earlier than that for me if i look at like where the the trail started so in 2010 probably i was emailing imba us asking uh if there was anything imba related in europe because i've seen in the past some magazines talking about imba in in, in europe but it was never really clear if it has an actual presence or an office or something like that. And back then I was buying a mountain bike action magazine and all those very expensive imported magazines from the US. So I knew what Imba was doing in the US, but I wanted to know how can we bring it to, to Europe. And that email somehow got in a database, I think, that got used a few years later in 2012 when Imba Europe was... Uh, starting to actually be founded and, and, and work. So I was invited in one of the first meetings that they did that was in uh, Switzerland, in Zurich. And from 2012, I was part of a group of people that got the start of Imba Europe. And then 
in 2014, 2015. I was the one of the founders of Imba Italy. And then I was lucky enough to be invited to join the board of, of Imba Europe in 2016. So that was a little bit of the, the start of how I got officially involved in, in mountain biking in an official role in, uh, in Europe. And from the very beginning, one of the things that I thought was very important was what type of trail rating system do we advertise in Europe? Because of course, we're in by Europe, in by Italy, we have this connection with, with in by in the US, but there were some reasons for which the in by North America system in Europe was not perfect. And the colors, we'll get more in detail probably later, was one of these topics. So I said to the rest of the board, we get emails from people that say we have a bike park or a trail destination. Uh, what is the trail rating system that you suggest us to use? And we never had a clear answer because, yeah, we're Imba. Imba US has a great system. There is very established. But in Europe, there are also, like Misha said, many other ones. So it kind of depends. And we never really had the time or the staff or the, the budget to invest in this topic that was, of course, not at the top of the list of the advocacy issues that we had to deal with. So I started doing some research, comparing other systems, and, and then COVID happened. And in Italy, we were in full lockdown for several months. We could barely get out of our apartment. And so all of a sudden, I had all this time and the trail rating system analysis was one of the things that was just laying there in the corner of the desk. So I started working more on it. And at some point, uh, cross paths with, the, with Misha that was presenting uh, online the outcomes of a survey that he did on this topic. And just by listening his presentation, I something clicked. I said, this guy is thinking in the same direction that I'm thinking. He has done already a lot of work. Let's just get in touch and and let's start from there and see what uh, what we can do together. And we were foolish foolish enough to dedicate thousands of hours <laughs> of our own time in uh, finding how to split the hair in like hundred different slices on uh, on this topic. You just brought up a good point, and that is Misha did a survey. Let's talk about that survey. So just to illustrate that this wasn't just your two opinions and that it really is a more broad-based uh, system that came out of talking to a lot of different both professionals and just mountain bikers in general yeah absolutely as uh, like ground groundwork we tried to establish the baseline for europe at least and so we made a survey amongst mountain bikers uh, about 1200 participated and asking various questions and in terms one example how many difficulty levels should the technical difficulty have? And just uh, offering everything between like two and 10, I don't know what. So, and, but we, we ask questions um, where we realized before, hey, these are potentially critical ones. And uh, when, when I listened to your podcast number 77 of two years ago with uh, James Flatten, you brought up a couple of these critical questions there. One was, for example, hey, is riding in a bike park on a jump line really the same than riding in a high alpine trail? Can this have the same rating system or not? So we, we put these things into the survey to just see what the participating, participating bikers think about it. And th this was a good baseline. And then we did workshops and interviews with uh, many people. Like I started here in Switzerland with people from the official side, with trail builders, with guides, with instructors. Then as soon as Eduardo joined, he could bring in the Imba Europe network. So yeah, and since this, until we first published the first version of the description of the system, that was about two years and thousand working hours from our side. And um, so we had already a lot of opinions in there. And what's important to know, the, the ITRS is, as we think, the first system that is continuously developed. So we are still working on it. And as soon as somebody applies it and we get feedback, we, we're going to adapt. So the thing is fine-tuned over the time. So we are now already two years into this fine-tuning process. Let's set the, the baseline for what, what you have in terms of the four, different, the four different areas, which are technical difficulty, endurance, 
exposure, and wilderness. Why did you pick those four things and kind of go into like, just we'll get into the details in terms of like what these four things mean before we get into the colors and all the other stuff that goes into this. Cause it is a very, it's, it's a very interesting topic. And, you know, I, I look at it every day. You two made it your career. Mountain bikers get confused all the time. So when we started analyzing all the hundreds of systems that are already in place, some national, some more regional, um, we quickly realized that some systems had technical difficulty at the core, at the center of what was the analysis and of the trail. And other systems were using other factors, sometimes baked in. So the output was just one color or one number, and other times it was split. So we tried to figure out what are the, the parameters that we actually need as a user to understand, and what are the things that we can combine together, and what are the things that need to be separate. One aspect that I think is important to stress is uh, where we come from in terms of our background and where we, we ride. Uh, both myself and Misha have been riding a lot, of course, in Europe uh, and in the Alps, but we traveled abroad and we have seen a variety of trails, legacy uh, that were built for multiple reasons, from hiking to bringing water to uh, a small village, and then also bike park stuff that has been designed and built just to have fun with a bike. And so one aspect that I think it's uh, really easy to understand in terms of why we separated it and why we thought it was important to have it is the exposure. Uh, you can be a super technical rider. You can be at home in any bike park, jump anything, ride any super technical thing. But if you suffer from vertigo and you really hate exposed sections, you might stumble upon many trails in the Alps where technically maybe it's within your reach, but there are sections that are just so exposed that if you fall off the trail, there's like probably no way that you're going to be able to tell the story afterwards. And so that is really important for us to have that parameter separated because otherwise uh, you arrive in a Swiss or in the Dolmites uh, town and you need to understand if one trail is technical versus exposed. If you just put everything together like some other systems do, then you you don't know anymore. So you could start a trail and then halfway through you need to maybe turn around and go back or write a section that you're super scared of and that's not good as well and as guys we've had people that started crying and they were down on their knees because they were petrified of exposures that sometimes were not that bad and not that dangerous but it's something that you cannot really control if uh, you have that fear it's probably going to be with you forever you can train it a little bit but it's not as easy to train it as endurance that, for example, you can mitigate with the knee bike or just getting more fitness or like technical training courses. You can get better rider, get more at home with jumping or rock gardens or anything. Uh, and wilderness is the other fourth example of basically how much planning you need. So it's another factor that gives the rider an idea of how remote is the area where I'm going to ride and how much basically do I have to prepare? And coming again from a, from a guider's guiding point of view, do I need to bring just a small water bottle or do I need to bring a lot more water? Do I need to bring food? Do I need to bring maybe a GPS device for satellite communication because there's no uh, cell phone coverage? And all these things are very different and they require different training or different equipment. And if you just like put everything together and say, this trail is this loop is level four or black or pink or whatever you want to call it, unless you have a way of conveying these informations in a separate way, there's no way that the end user is going to be able to prepare for that. And especially with the legacy trails where there's been no 
designing or planning ahead. So you have things combined that you, in a bike park or in a purpose-built trail, you wouldn't. So you could have a green technical level trail with a super exposed, deadly rock face on one side. You would never design or suggest to do it, but it's out there and you need to wait, you need to have a system in our opinion that can describe that so that the end user knows what's ahead. Yeah, if I may, may summarize that, um, also in my words, since we put the mountain biker in the center, the rider in the center of the system, we thought of which are the different skill sets that you need to have. And we came up with these four different skill sets, which are reflected in the four aspects. So one is like riding skills, technical difficulties related to that. The other one is Fitness, the endurance rating is related to that. You can train both. You can be good at one and bad at the other. Then, as Eduardo said, and I'm one of the examples, fear of heights. Forget me on the trail um, that has exposure level black in the ITRS, which means if you fall, you die. But it's existing here. I have these trails around my corner. Technically, yeah, easy. But no mistakes, huh? And then the planning thing. Okay, uh, what do I need to prepare before I go on the ride? So that's why we came up with these four things. Then the challenge was, ooh, it's complex. How do we communicate that? Yeah, for sure. And you, and so to, to go deeper on that, you have four different, five different colors, essentially. Four, four core colors plus orange, I'm going to say. You have, you have what we see around the world, or at least what I'm familiar with which is the green, the blue, the, the red, which I get confused on the red personally because I see red stuff in the United States that would be more difficult than black or double black. But I also see red stuff the way it's portrayed here, which is in between blue and black. So that just in itself is like confusing to me. And I was just at a bike park, a gravity bike park. So I want to, we could talk about bike parks in multiple ways because that's another, you know, like, the Swiss bike park has a skills bike park and a gravity bike park has lift access, right? So those are the two different ways I look at it. But I was just at a gravity bike park with lift access on Saturday and it went green, blue, red. Now it went green, blue, black, red as red being the most difficult. And I had to like kind of rewire my brain because I kind of look at it the way you look at it, you know? And so let's talk about, that's a lot of words to say. Let's talk about the colors quickly. I mean, we don't have to do it quickly. This is a podcast. We can go on forever. Eduardo, go on. <laughs> so when we analyzed the trail rating systems, we also uh, expanded a little bit the study to uh, ski slopes and what is done in the winter for, for skiing in Europe, in Japan, and in the US. And at least in Europe, the green, blue, red, black kind of order is established in other sports like skiing, for example, and other systems use it in, in that way. And, and so when we had to decide from the survey and from other feedbacks, uh, how many levels do we need? We settled on, on five that we thought was giving enough room to have some detail without having like in rock climbing, uh, 10,000 different levels with plus and minuses, uh, which you, you could do in a, in a certain way, but that's, uh, that's another topic when you start saying like dark blue or light blue, but anyway. Aside from that, we, we felt that red was very important to have it there because many times uh, lift access trails and bike parks happen to be in the same slopes where you have ski slopes in the winter. So skiing is much more popular than mountain biking, definitely with uh, more popular than downhill biking, <laughs> if you look at the numbers of tourists. So it's likely that people come from that background and have seen those colors in that order. And one thing that we often had to discuss was the colors are at least the ones that you can clearly differentiate are limited in a certain way. So when we stumble upon a color that it means something else in a different system, we always try to use it in a way that is safer for the user. What I mean that if uh, you think that red, because you come from US, you use maybe trail forks that double black on a map, it's hard to show. So they use the red. That's one of the main issues that we also stumbled upon. 
what is the worst case that could happen to you if you come over to Europe and ride in a bike park that is using ITRS, that you end up in a trail that is less technical, less demanding than what you were hoping for. And in our minds, that's a safer point than the other way around. So we always try to have, if it was discussing about dotted lines or colors or shapes or whatever, worst case scenario, you end up being on a trail that is not as challenging as you shooting for, but you're safe. The other way around, it would be very, very difficult and very dangerous. And especially for beginners that maybe they don't have yet trained their eye to immediately recognize that section of trail ahead of me is getting more technical, more nasty than what I am capable of riding today on this bike with this weather condition, then I stop and walk it. But that's something that you need to have experience to get to that point. We often forget at the beginning, you just crash and you have no idea what happened. And so trying to avoid those situations was was very important. And so five levels was there. Orange was used in some systems to indicate jump lines and, and bike parks. So Pro it's lines. and pro lines. So it's already in the minds of people that have seen the color in a in a bike park environment, it's already connected with the like higher stuff uh, in terms of tef- technical difficulty. And so when we started thinking also not only the icons and the colors, but how do I convey this information on, on, on a map when I have just a line, then you need to have five different colors. So that was the main reason that we diverted from the black double black idea and move to the expert extreme. That's um, how we call these two levels in the ITRS. Therefore, black in the double diamond is at that point orange. So you could also do the the joke that orange is the new black, but uh, yeah, that's a humoristic approach. Yeah, and it's really due to the history of the ski slopes in North America. The red wasn't known. We, we actually, we dig deeper and the very, very origin is by Walt Disney, if I understood correctly, they in the what, first half of the previous century, or in the middle of it, they uh, were developing a ski resort in the US, and they came up with colors and shapes. The colors changed after it, but there was never a red in it. The shapes are from that uh, time. So there we have still, we have the fact, and it's not easy, and it confused you, Josh. So red means two different things on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's only because of the line topic that trail forks had to find a color to depict double black. And unfortunately, they came up with red. Because, yeah, it's it's a standardization that hopefully in some time may find a solution. Well, I'm going to throw a sad sad topic out just more for humor than anything. And this is... Last summer, I noticed in the U.S., I believe it was in Montana, a ski resort labeled a new trail, double blue square. What? I'm so confused. <laughs> so it's like if you took the red out and you just went green, blue, black, and you just used the green circle, the blue square, and the black expert, this is like basically not quite expert, but more than intermediate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have even also seen like a blue square with a um, black diamond in it. I've seen this also I would, on some. And my my brain would make that double blue at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So it just goes to illustrate, you know, we're still. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. I really like the system. One, and I recently came across this in my real line of work, and I'm gonna say real line of work because it's the one that pays the bills. A rider that I met again in Florida is colorblind, you know? And so being, you know, that's obviously not common, but it's, it's a thing, right? And so as I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, what about for someone that's colorblind? Well, it's simple because it actually has the word beginner under the red circle. I'm sorry, under the, the green circle. Right. And so you have a shape, you know, so you have a circle, a square, a triangle, a diamond and two diamonds. And so in that case, color doesn't really matter if you look at it from that perspective. And you have the what it is labeled at, which is beginner, intermediate, advanced, expert, and extreme. You know, so I think, I don't know if you took colorblind into consideration, but maybe Misha, you could ex- expand on that because it's something that 
is never talked about really in this whole world of system of ratings. Yeah, it's um, it's true, and um, we on purpose used the the icons, the symbols that are used in North America, because so that's the easiest way for colorblind people to differentiate between the levels. So, and that's the reason why we use the double diamond for the highest level in the ITRS, but there we give it a different color for, as we discussed before, to be able to show it also as a line. So for the technical difficulty, we have each color related with a symbol that is already established. Because one principle of the ITRS was, ideally, the bikers don't recognize that it's new. Maybe a little bit, but it shouldn't be something out of the blue, the whole thing. Big work is behind it in all the definitions and how do you rate it and everything. You may come to it later. But the surface should look familiar. And then we have a bit the challenge because we have these other three aspects. So if we go away from the technical difficulty, go to the endurance, for example, we display this A only for a total route that you do and not for an individual trail. Unless you have a trail like the whole enchilada, which is basically a tour, so fine, then you get, get this as well. But if you have in Europe like a one kilometer trail, we do not rate the endurance of that trail. And we also do not rate the wilderness of that trail. These two factors are only important for whole route. Huh? The trail itself has difficulty and exposure. But so for these other three, where we have also different levels with the, the same color coding, there we do not have extra icons, not to invent the real third time. What we do there is we work with little dots for the colorblind people in the um, graphic that we developed that shows the four aspects for one route, then which is a circle for the readers that don't know the system. It's a circle with four like pieces of cake. We call it the route pie. And in, in, in the pie parts um, for exposure, for example, you have a color, the exposure symbol, and you have dots. And for the colorblind, they can then see, ah, this is level three or four. So, but be, Because as you say, um, and even if you're not colorblind, but you, you have something like this maybe as a signage, and it's weathered, and the, the light is bad, also then it's safer to have a double factor thingy in it, not the color only. Let's talk about where this is all rooted, because from what I can tell, it's within within your you know your presentation is that it it appears to be rooted in safety and to just provide information so people can make their own decisions. Maybe Eduardo, maybe you can explain why why that's important because I've came across this in a, in, a, in a lot of different arenas, and I think it's important to let you know to let people know. The information they need to know so they can choose to or choose not to do something. Yeah. So in our mind, it was very important to to put, like Misha said, the biker at the at the center of uh, of the system. And from a guiding perspective, is very natural that you like think of your client and you think how to take care of your client and take some of the decisions for him because you're you're paid to make sure that he's safe. And from the IMBA perspective that I, of course, uh, carry with the mission is to have more people on bikes, uh, be more uh, inclusive, have more diversity. And so one of the first things that you stumble upon is that mountain biking could be very intimidating for, for a beginner because you don't know, you get maybe in the woods and you're far from roads and you, it's not very easy to start as a as a sport compared to other ones. And if you're lacking information to take an informed decision on where to start easy and then slowly walk, uh, well, ride uh, up, uh, up your path uh, to improve, then it's very difficult and could be dangerous. Then you could crash and then decide that you just want to go and play football <laughs> because it's, uh, it looks less, uh, less dangerous. So combining all these things, we, we wanted to have a system that could provide as not as many information as possible because that could be also overwhelming. So we've studied a way that depending on the end user and the context that you want to use the signage or the website or the printed map, 
you could use the route pie that Misha was explaining earlier. So it's just one icon and it gives you more information on, on that, uh, on that route. And then you could get more in detail and give more and more information about why the technical difficulty is, is at that level. How is the split between how many trails uh, inside of that loop, for example, are at the highest tech level? If there are sections that are a little bit easier so you can catch your breath. So there's a lot of other information that you can bring to, to the end user, but it's important not to overwhelm them because if you go to a beginner and you just start shoveling out uh, numbers, oh, this tour is like 20K and this much uh, percent of climbing and this that steep and with these type of features, they probably have no idea if 20% is uh, steep or is something that they can ride for 10 minutes or two hours. So you need to find a way to convey maybe just one information if it's an absolute beginner so they they know okay i'll start from this option that is easier and then if i'm at home i'm comfortable that i can move up and then of course if you are super experienced and we have had some feedbacks um quite rare i would say but some people uh in the comments saying we don't need all this information mountain biking needs to be wild and i don't want to know well be my guest. Don't read the signage. Don't open a website. Just go and explore and have fun if you have the skills and you're willing to just go into a trail having no idea what it what it is. But that doesn't stop us from shouldn't stop us from providing that information to the people that actually benefit from it and they can have a great time, be healthy, uh, and have an active lifestyle mountain biking instead of just going to the gym and just running on a treadmill in a in a closed room which is uh my opinion a little bit better to be outside so let's just try to provide the tools and the information from people for people to take safe informed decisions on where to ride their mountain bikes and maybe to add a little detail uh since josh you already uh read out the wording how we name the technical difficulty levels. This is on purpose, not easy or hard. Uh, this is beginner. But for the English, it's a bit difficult. Uh, in, in the other languages in Europe, we really describe the person. Uh, well, for the uh, endurance, for example, um, we name it like generally sportive, um, some training necessary, very hard structure training necessary. Or like the exposure, we describe what happens if you fall off the trail. So either like it's the same than crashing on the trail up to, okay, you're dead. We try to make it as personal as it kind of is possible that you can relate to that. Just as This is just one of the tiny details we also spend time on. So we mentioned earlier that you had, you did a pretty inclusive survey uh, to get feedback from all sorts of different mountain bikers. You've also worked with Trail builders, what was their take on trail ratings? I'm really curious on this one. And we'll just to kind of keep this organized, we'll start with Misha and then we'll go to Adoro. Yeah, due to my presence here, uh, being based in Switzerland, I got in contact with um, guys from Velo Solutions that actually built the Swiss bike park trails. And two of them, meanwhile, founded their own company. It's called Vast Trails. Um, they are actually behind some of the trails of the last Enduro World Cup, which was around the corner here in Alic Arena. And so with those guys, I was always in exchange. Hey, what do you think? What for you? And we were talking about trails that all we knew. I asked them, okay, what do you think should this trail be rated? To also get their gut feeling in there. I also did the same with bike guides to see uh, what is kind of a common understanding. And from the trail building side, what was very important for us, because we had that question, can there be one trail rating system for purpose-built bike trails and for legacy trails? Because here in Switzerland, many people said, no, it's two different sports. But the trail builder said, hey, come on, this is just because historically, bike parks in Europe were built focused on jump lines because the rest is actually there. We have zillions of trails that are tech because they are there. They were built to bring up the goats to the mountains and I don't know what. 
But those guys from the trail building companies here in Switzerland have said, yeah, the trend is different. The trend is to go and mix these things. And we have some purpose-built trails here now also in Europe where you have a tech section and suddenly you are in a jump line and then you get, again, slow, so very diverse. And this was one very important answer for us to make it one system for everything. Only in the details, as Eduardo explained, in the end, we can tell people, hey, this trail is level black in the ITRS, so level four out of five, would be more or less comparable to double black actually in the US. It has this level because it has huge jumps. Or the opposite would be it has this level because there are corners that are so tight that you need to front pivot. All this information is in the system, but as Eduardo said, you have to dig. You don't overwhelm everybody, of course, with this stuff. So the first sign is, okay, that thing is black. But you could go deeper, but it's clear and could also be. And so to go back to the trail builders, that was when we developed it. And then we did recently an event, and I think Eduardo can explain the backgrounds, where we had some trail builders applying the um, ITRS. And they were actually very happy that it also fitted their understanding of trails. It was very interesting at the very beginning of the development of the system to get feedback from very different people from different uh, backgrounds. So trail builders was one, and often they had a view and needs that were very far away from, for example, people that work in the tourism office uh, kind of departments. Because normally, if you work in a tourism office, you want to advertise that your destination is perfect, is better than the next one over, and you have trails for every level. So what they sometimes do is take whatever system they choose that they want to use and try to stretch it. So the easiest trail in that valley, that's going to be green, and the most technical steepest one is going to be the highest level that you have. There is double black or orange or whatever the system allows. But that's that's not ideal because it's very local. So, okay, now I know that in this valley, that trail is the easiest and going through these other 10, that one is the toughest, but it doesn't link with what the terrain is and what's in the next valley over. So there are places where the easiest trail is by far something that most people probably will have to walk some sections because the terrain is super steep or super rocky or other uh, other reasons, talking about legacy stuff. And and the trail builder normally has an opposite approach because they think of, okay, this is technically it's green, but it's super exposed. It's not okay. So we'll need to build a, a proper beginner trail somewhere else where in a place that is not that exposed. So bridging these two needs was not, not very easy. But in a certain way, we think that having a system that is objective and gives you specific numbers and guidelines to assess the trail, it's also in a certain way an advocacy tool because you can go to your municipality or to your tourism office and explain them, well, this is an objective way of analyzing trails and everything that we have is either concentrated in the less technical stuff uh, or more technical, we are lacking something. So if you want to have a very immersive experience that we have something for everybody of every level, then we are lacking something that we need to reclaim if it's an old trail that is not used anymore and needs some Um, some heavy maintenance or build something new. Well, if you just stretch whatever system you use, it could be kind of dangerous because we've seen places that advertise their easiest trail as green. And then you find like double jumps or drops that are four or five meters long. And you go, well, that doesn't really look like a beginner's trail. Well, but that's the easiest that we have. But that's not really an answer because if you have someone coming from outside, it's like, oh, I have my kid or uh, my girlfriend, my boyfriend that just started mountain biking. I'll take them on the easiest trail. And then you want something that is like safe to ride, not just realize, oh, my God, this is the less technical out of all of them. But it's just way too much for uh, for us today. 
maybe it's not directly related just to the question about um, trail builders, but what Eduardo referred to. And I recently followed some discussions in forums, um, especially in the English speaking community. And it appeared to me that there it's kind of common wisdom that trail ratings are relative, as Eduardo described. So we take the easiest and make our way up, and the hardest is the black, and the easiest is the green. And because most likely it is not easy to do it objectively. So keep this aside. If you have that situation, what we think is the beneficiary of this is not the mountain biker. It is the destination because they can falsely claim we have everything, although they don't. And also easier for the trail builders because yeah, they just do something, but they don't need to get creative. If, for example, you are in the Netherlands in a flat country, and you get the order, please build something double black. Well, there's no gradient or very little, but you can, if you're creative, you can do a double black trail in the Netherlands. I know them because I'm part half Dutch. So it's existing. And what may be even harder is to build a green trail in the Alps, because then you also need to put a lot of work. So it makes the life for the trail builders also a bit easier if you have this relative approach. If you go to the as objective as possible approach of the ITRS, benefit, as Eduardo said, is you can analyze as a destination to get really broad, or you say, I specialize in X, Y, Z. And as a trail builder, you can also easier differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself and say, hey, I have the knowledge to do green trails in steep terrain or the other way around. So that's what we are hoping to get to. And that's the feedback we got from a couple of trail builders that said, hey, if this thing is established, it's making our life easier as trail builders because we can also go to a client, do the analysis and say, hey, that's the international standard. You're lacking a green and a blue. I like that you brought up the relative part because this is where I, I kind of go sideways. I don't like a rating system based on relative to other stuff in the region. I would prefer that if it's green where I'm at, it's representative of being green halfway around the world. Absolutely. And the same with all the other colors and ratings, because if I'm a solid intermediate rider, I want to know that I can go ride a blue trail in Switzerland or in Italy and not have mandatory gaps because it's relative to this topography, you know, or the other way around. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we actually aim to achieve with the ITRS and uh, may sound uh bit uh, utopic but in the end we would like to have it globally that's the vision so that everybody has a common understanding what for example blue is and it's also consistently applied this is something say the system and its description itself so we've been working on it for roughly two years but by that time we realized hey this is the smaller part of the work because if you have this thing on paper and it can be as well thought through as, as you can, you need to standardize the application as well. Because it's not going to be the case that Eduardo and me travel the world and raid every trail. Then it would be consistent. If we would be paid for it without a family, it could be nice. But uh, no, so we had to think of something else that this is working out. So you just brought up a whole new topic. Oh, Eduardo, you're going to say something. Yeah, I was about to say that when we wrapped up the um, the documentation for the ICRS, we just uh, virtually shook, hand, shook hands uh, on Zoom with Misha and said, good job. And then soon realized, well, this this is the beginning. That's not the end because now how do we apply this? How So the, the next step was to start thinking and working on the whole framework of how do we train people to apply it consistently? Uh, do we need to develop other tools like the smartphone app that we have developed to to apply and collect all this information? Because for for a while, we started trying to apply it with pen and paper, and we soon realized that it was not really realistic to have a client that would be willing to pay that much money to invest in like having someone collect all this information with pen and paper in the woods, maybe under the rain and then get back to the office and then take all those notes and bring them into a spreadsheet, it would be just endless. And so, yeah, that's when the chapter two, I guess, <laughs> started of 
how do we make it doable for people to to apply it in a consistent way? I just realized maybe the listeners uh, are missing one for this part important piece of information because what, why is it so much work to rate a trail? I think uh, I, I'd like to explain that. Let, let's focus on technical difficulty for now because that's the hardest part in the end. As we outlined, we have these five levels um, and um, the differentiation of these five technical difficulty levels is done by the writing skills that you need to manage them, to write them. So the easiest thing is green. That means you have been riding a bicycle on a road. You know how a bicycle works. You have no other idea than that. You, you don't know about bike body separation, which I learned from a previous podcast of yours, uh, this term. So you don't know that you have to stand up when you roll on a trail. You just keep on sitting. The green trail is able, you, you, you can ride it while sitting or a bike, uh, a kid on the balance bike can ride it. Then on the other hand, you put like the level, the highest level, we have it orange, it's Red Bull Rampage. So totally extreme. And some World Cup downhill race tracks and so on or like trial world championship stuff. So behind each level, we have a set of riding skills that we describe. So, and this is in the description for, for the mountain bikers, if you want to read through it. And those then were translated into how does the corresponding trail look like? And there we, we didn't reinvent the wheel, but we, um, we maybe the existing wheel was square. Yeah. And so we, we tried to make it round. So some factors are well known, like it's a grade, the corner radius, the height of a step of an obstacle, and we refined these things into measurable stuff. And some are not measurable. Some are more qualitative. For example, the jumps, it's not all about the size. It's about how much it does kick you, how well you can predict it, and so on. Um, so we have there more qualitative descriptions. But that means behind all that, there's a there's a technical specification for a trail that you can go into the train and measure. And by this, and this is what Eduardo said, if you do this with pen and paper, and uh, okay, uh, this means like in that system, uh, it's going to be red. It's an awesome amount of work. And it's also not well documented. And that's why we realized um, one essential thing is to automate and standardize that. So what's better than an iPhone, uh, no, um, a mobile phone app to do that. So this is one thing. And then it was part of a big ecosystem that we're actually trying to develop. But this is just like the amount of work. Somebody may say, hey, you're crazy to get to these like objective results. Yeah, we did a test and it's work, but it's uh, the feedback of the first people who are using it is actually pretty awesome. So the next topic I was going to bring up is the certification, which I think we're you know, we're totally rolling into that, but you just spurred my brain on one thing that hasn't been talked about at all yet. And I don't know how it works into the system or if it works in the system. And that is the width of a trail. Uh -huh. And I bring that up for multiple reasons, but mainly I'm going to say for an adaptive athlete. Yeah, that's true. We had, especially the Swiss bike park, because one of their missions is also to be inclusive for, for every person. So to have also um, at least one loop in their system that is uh, possible to ride for adaptive bikes. So um, the way we see it is we measure the trail width and the information is in the end for certified rated trail is available. So you could then check if an adaptive bike goes through it or not. But the influence the trail width has on the technical difficulty rating is seen from the perspective of uh, normal bike i must say and at some point we were about to skip it at all because it's not a specific skill set that you need to have to ride a narrow trail unless you go maybe below 30 centimeters so that you need to be able to ride straight but we kept it for that reason that you know the information is there but um a trail is not necessarily more difficult when it's narrow if you imagine like a nice flat grass, meadow, there's a 30 centimeter, totally flat, nicely compacted trail in it. If you would say everything below half a meter is black, that thing would be black, but every kid can ride that. So 
Now we, we did a lot of these discussions. So this is not going to be the case. So you find for the trail width some very narrow numbers actually in the eye. Was but an you have information. There was an interesting discussion before the first training that we did with um, with external people, uh, with certified trail raters, and and with them again about where do you start measuring the width of the trail? <laughs> you have a little bit of grass on the side, or if you have the main line, and then maybe a sideline that you could also ride on. So it's also that was part of a big discussion, and then different documents that we have found online have a different drawings and definitions of what the back slope is versus the trailway or the trail bed or the trail tread. And we need to find some common terminology because otherwise, if I measure just where it's just dirt and you can put your wheels on, like Misha said, it could be 10 centimeters. And then actually, if you ride outside of it it's not a problem because it's just flat on the side and there's a little bit of grass so that's not even that it sounds easy at the beginning oh yeah it's it's narrow it's wide trail then it's actually a little bit more complicated unless you have people that use the same approach in how they measure how wide the trail is because otherwise you end up having trails that are not challenging at all that could look way too technical because just the main line is just a little bit narrower yeah it's a good example josh happy you brought that up for like what we what i said to or refer to making that wheel round because yeah trail width everybody who had systems based on some numbers had it in there but if you looked into it like yeah this is all green it doesn't matter if the thing is two meter one meter half a meter this is technically not demanding so we had to dive deeper into it. And the same is for the trail grade, actually. That's another one. Uh, at least the inbound North America system, we perceive in the way that it is partially building instruction. Because, of course, from a trail building perspective, you wouldn't build stuff steep to make it sustainable. But the riding skill is not different if you have 5% or like 7% average grade. It doesn't matter. At real high grades, then it starts to be uh, interesting. So also there, we went to totally different numbers in the ITRS. Because we say, yeah, fine, the, the ITRS specification is not a building instruction. You should not build a trail as to the maximum what is possibly defined in the ITRS. That won't be sustainable, most likely. It's only the perspective of the skills that you need. So from a building perspective, and we're going to get on to certification, I promise. But from a, from a building perspective, because that's where a lot of my world is is centered in, and then I'll, and a lot of listeners of this podcast are you know builders sitting you know sitting in a machine listening to this. It wasn't a I, I didn't foresee that being a thing, but it is a thing. You know, when we're on the planning and design side of things, you know, if we have a client that's asking for, we'll say a certain mix of trails, you know, beginner, intermediate, advanced, or expert, and Topography aside, say they have all the topography necessary, you know, to do a beginner trail, to do an intermediate trail and do an expert trail. If you look at what I'm going to refer to as the IMBA North America system, it has a tread width associated with that system. And you just brought up a very good point that you can have, especially for a kid that's got narrow, we're going to say just narrow handlebars. You can have a very beginner green level trail. That's 12 inches wide, because guess what? They fit on it. Yeah, the, the fit is another topic, of course, but at least to say they can ride it. It's not a problem. They can roll it. Huh? In, in the trail width, this bracket, I promise I quickly close it in the trail width. In the ITRS, there's also one sub-factor called like clearance for the bike, so either handlebars between trees or, I don't know, fences and walls, and also pedals if we have deep ruts and ditches and all that stuff. So this we have in there. Huh? But yeah, so if you, the, the technical specification of the trails in the ITRS gives you as a trail builder, the ranges where you can start to mix up kind of a blue trail. It tells you, you could go until this with the step height. It, you could go until this with the width. You could go until this with the 
uh, corner radius. You could go until this with the maximum grade. You don't have to. The system works in a way that if one of these, it's nine factors, I think, below the technical difficulty that you can measure, if one of them has the level blue and the rest is green, the trail is blue. Uh, this is like one ground rule there. But you could then go and say, well, this is a terrain I have. I cannot make it steep. So I'm going to work with obstacles. Or like I'm going to work with jumps that fit to the description um, of a blue jump in the system. Uh, so we hope that it also enables there to, to fit this stuff. And as I said, so you could also make a double black thing in US words or like a black trail in ITRS, without, which is flat. But then you have obstacles like hell in it and tight turns and I don't know what. I think that from a trail building perspective, it's very important, like a uh, same, same topic. If you are assessing a trail, like a certified trail grader, uh, that's how we call them to look at the context. So of course, saying that a trail that is 30 centimeters wide is technical by itself. It would be hard to say if it's correct or not, because it depends on, on the context. So what's, after those 30 centimeters really matters. Is it just dirt and a little bit of grass? Then yes, the main trail tread, uh, it's 30 centimeters, but it doesn't really count at that point because you can actually ride a little bit off of it and it's not an issue. But if you are on a trail that is literally 30 centimeters wide and on the side, there's like loose gravel that is just going down a cliff, then yeah, you have to be very precise. And in the contest, in that, in that sense, makes a huge difference. So I think that in, in trail building, you, you can use the, the values that we have in the ITRS, but not blindly, of course. You have to put thought into the context. And, uh, and that's where like, great trail builders can, can build stuff that is super technical, even if the surrounding doesn't look like it was easy to do. Or, or vice versa. So I wouldn't just give this numbers to someone that builds car roads uh, or swimming pools, because of course it would become complicated because unless you have a specific skill set in trail building and mountain biking, then you could get things very wrong very quickly. I'm going to throw a quick conversion out there for those that are not fully on board with the metric system. And that is 30 centimeters is around 12 inches. Okay. Thank okay, you for doing yeah, Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I had to quick do the math. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of the, the challenges. Definitely. Talking about that context and yeah, this goes into the certification topic soon, Josh, I promise. Um, think about maximum trail grade. And so far there were, in some systems, you had two values, one for the average grade and one for the maximum grade. Fine. So we kept that. And then we started thinking, okay, riding skills required. Is it enough to say that trail has 30% grade over 10 meters and that makes it a certain grade? We, the answer is no, because it depends on what comes after this. If you can open your brakes shoot down that 10 meters, you have a nice, flat, totally clear view. Everything after that is like technically green. A hit rolls down that thing. Yeah? If after these 10 meters, there is a 90 degree turn, it's a totally different story because you need to end up there totally in control. So this is one thing where context comes into play with, um, <clears throat> with the ITRS. And that's what we train as we said, so we have built a training scheme to educate people in rating trails. And one of these things is to explain them, okay, you measure stuff on the trail. The description in the ITRS gives you guidelines. So for the maximum grade, we, for example, have two values. One is A, you have to be totally in control. And this value is much lower. Um, then the other opposite is, yeah, you can basically let go. And so we train that to apply this in a consistent manner. Because in the end, uh, it may sound, ah, oh, cool, uh, you can measure this and everything is totally objective. You'll always find situations that's a great thing about mountain biking. It's so diverse. You end up at a place like, hey, fuck, how do I gonna rate that one? So you need to play with the factors that the ITRS provides you. And it does hopefully more than previous systems, but at some point you always need to put yourself into the shoe of a rider 
okay, what would you do? Let's get into certifications because you've trained people on how to do this. Let's talk about how that, how you got to that point, obviously, because you can't, I want to say, because you can't replicate yourselves, right? You can't be everywhere. And so you want, and if you want to see this grow, we need to, you know, get other people on the same page, but how is it received and, and how did that, you know, how did that first certification go? So like I was saying, chapter one was to create the documentation that was the foundation of uh, of the ITRS. And then we realized, well, if we want this to work, we need to build a framework that allows different people from different parts of the world to apply it consistently. So in the goal was if we take one trail and we have 10 people that did the training with us, uh, and apply the ITRS, we all come to pretty much the same conclusions. Otherwise, it, it would not work. So there was a night before the first training that we did uh, in last April where we were kind of on the edge of our seats because we didn't really know what to expect. I mean, we were hoping that everybody had more or less arrived to the same conclusions on the exam routes that we gave them to assess that we previously assessed as well, of course. But until the moment that we just downloaded all the data and compared it with uh, with our reports, we, we were not sure if everything that we did was working. But yeah, uh, luckily, or uh, thanks to the work, uh, depending how you want to see it, uh, the results were pretty close to each other. And so in, in our minds, that means that uh, we have created a system that could be replicated from different people. So there was a little bit of the, the background of, of that. So uh, to take one, one step back, we, we had to design a training framework and all the frequently asked questions of scenarios and situations where, okay, here it's actually a little bit tricky to like, do I measure the slope in this place or in that place, what's around it? And so we started like assessing different trails in different parts of, uh, of Italy and Switzerland and stumbling upon issues and then discussing how can we have a system, uh, what is the practice that people should follow so that we all do it in the same way. And we started advertising the very first um, training that we did, like I said, last last April to people that that we knew that were close to us that provided feedback, uh, mountain bike guides or trail builders from different backgrounds, because it was a little bit of a of a trail and error in a, in a certain way, because we had the, the brand new app for the smartphone, uh, the system to assess the, to evaluate all the candidates was uh, very complicated and manually intensive. So we, we had to double check that everything that we thought and, uh, and built was actually working properly. And so we had people from different parts of uh, uh, of Europe, but yeah, the different countries uh, was uh, Italy, uh, Switzerland, UK, Spain. Portugal, Sweden, Spain. Greece. Uh, am I missing Spain somewhere? Denmark, not Spain. Yeah, yeah. Denmark, sorry, yeah. And so it was also very good from for us to have people from different countries and different types of trails that they have home and different backgrounds listen in, in depth to the ICRS and why we got to certain conclusions and and then go and assess some of the exam routes that we have prepared and and see that pretty much everybody was really really close to to the the target uh, so we came to all the same conclusions and that opens up to a new job we think that is the certified trail rater so people that uh, travel the world to assess uh, trails. And we know of one person that was already doing that specifically full time was Christopher from uh, from Denmark. And he, we were lucky enough to have him at the first uh, first training. So it was very cool to to have him as well because he was stumbling upon some of the same issues. Uh, he's doing trail assessment in, in Denmark for the on-trail project. And basically he has driven all across Denmark assessing all the trail, all the efficient mountain bike trails. But of course, that's something that is hard to replicate in every country. You cannot have just one person that travels the country and assesses all the trail. That's consistent because it's just the same person. 
but it's very hard if you have a large country or it's just not very easy. And so we were very happy to to have him and have his uh, his feedback on the training as well because uh, he's yeah probably the first person that was already already doing this and having a framework uh, with an app that um, certified trail raters use to collect all this information points on uh, on the trail and the routes that they assess opens up a whole new level of possibilities of double checking remotely uh, the work having a log of all the pictures and the measurements that uh, the CTR has taken on the trail. So from a liability standard point, point of view, um, you also have like a time stamps of when the trail was assessed and proof that pictures, that was the situation on that day. And if it changed afterwards because of a storm or because someone just broke uh, a jump or, or a bridge, um, then you have proof that the work was done and uh, and the objects and the, the trail was uh, was in good shape or at least in, in the shape that was assessed at that point in time and so we're working now on the next step which is certifying of the ctr remotely uh, and having another layer on top which is certifying a destination that uh, wants to have all their trails with a maintenance plan signage in place that have really their their work behind the the trails and so that the end user knows that they will be able to find trails in good shape and signage they will have information where to go and it's safer and a better time for everybody yeah maybe if i if i'd like to add something um so the way this exam for the ctr training just to imagine how this works huh is set up is okay we give some theoretical training about the system classroom and then we go out on the trail uh, everybody gets this rating app uh to familiar familiarize with that and in our first uh setting we did this for two days and it's kind of a crash course and we tested the, it there because as eduardo said uh, it were mostly people that we knew and in day three and the night before, the participants get a GPS track of a route of, say, maybe 500 meters of climbing up and down, 10K long or 15K long. And they have to rate the complete route, all trails on that, and have to give us in the end their result for four aspects of the system for the whole route, but also the details. So where was it exposed? Where did you see a water fountain and all that stuff? This was a really interesting point that then, okay, does this match with our rating? And this is what we assess and we make a comparison. And as Eduardo said, some were really spot on after two days of training. And that's what, and some were a bit off and then it was clear why. And okay, I need to work on that a little bit because it doesn't mean you you fail. You just understand, okay, I didn't, uh, uh, this part, I have to work a bit on it. And Christopher from Denmark, who for the past seven years, as Eduardo explained, rated their trails there. He was really, and I'd like to cite him, he was very happy about that because he said, hey, you were able to, to, to bring these people who have no idea about trail rating to the level that took me four years or so to work. And you made it in two days. So, um, yeah, we, we, we said it's a proof of concept. It's a starting we hope it's going to get even better in the end, but uh, that's what um, what this training is all about. I was going to say, could you provide an example of where maybe there was a difference or maybe, you know, where what someone brought back to you wasn't quite the way it was intended to come back as? Just to kind of see like w- where there was a, a difference in, in ratings to kind of illustrate mm-hmm. where this is going. Yeah, one topic was um, in the technical difficulty, we have a qualitative description of the surface, and which is also done in several systems. And, you have, and we, had, uh, we were close to, I don't know what existing system so far, at the, the version that we used for the training. It was like, yeah, asphalt or compacted, and then um, variable, large variations, and we added loose material, yes or no. But it was um, a short description, and apparently 
it was way too unspecific and it opened too many uh, options to choose. And then um, some people then hit in the app, you need to say, okay, this section here, yeah, that surface, mm, yeah, very variable. Okay, hit it. Oh, boom, that makes the thing black. And then they also said, yeah, actually, this shouldn't be black, but the app told me. And that was a perfect example where we realized because there you're a bit um, system blind because we had an understanding what what description was. Ah, okay, we need to refine these descriptions. And we refined these descriptions after that training in together with the people that took part and say, hey, how would you describe that? And since we had some very experienced trail builders in that training, so um, we we did that. And that's one example of what I said earlier. We are keeping refining and refining that stuff. The more different people are using it, the more good input you get. So this is a huge benefit. And the other thing is, by creating this role of a certified trail rater, so we we design what in economics you call call it an ecosystem. So these people, they can hopefully make a business out of that. So they have an incentive that the thing rolls out. Yeah, I could see where this would be important for trail building companies too, where they have someone on staff that would be certified in this to kind of one to provide a baseline within the company because I can tell you. Yeah, I, I work for a trail building company full time. And even within the company, we have discussions on what something should be. What, you know what I mean? Because we're humans, right? And I'm not saying someone's right or wrong. It's just te- you bring a different pers- people, different people bring different perspectives into the conversation based on their experiences. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's always the case. Um, and that's why we, we think, um, to really follow that goal of uh, a global understanding of trail ratings, you have to have a system where many people work together. There's like one central hub in the end that takes all that uh, input and decides, okay, yeah, that's cool. Uh, well, no, we don't do this. but um, And by digitizing everything like this, uh, it's also good to just double check from the outside and people can also then you go into all this stuff you know from other platforms so, so you could have certified trail raters commenting on other certified trail raters results saying hey why did you make this one there blue i've just recently written it so i mean you get into that but in a more qualified way because th- the concept of trail fox for example with uh, user-based ratings is nice in terms of comments but if you haven't like common understanding, like you see, very often see with the ratings in Trailforks, because there's more like the ego stuff going on. Now, ah, for me, that one is easy, so I make it blue. So we, we need to combine this in the end. But we start with the professional persons. If you get a big enough group, ideally a couple per country, then you actually start to build a common knowledge. And what we also foresee to explain a bit this ecosystem, because in the moment, the trainings, are done by Eduardo and me. But if the whole thing really grows, we need other trainers. So we have another role, which is called the ITRS expert. And um, after we did a couple of trainings ourselves, we are going to work on on this, that we, for example, have a trainer um, in, in Spain, in hopefully Asia, and North America would be excellent. So this is, this is how the, the structure, this framework around the system is. You brought up a point earlier, and I need to reiterate it, that a trail is rated based on its hardest feature, essentially. You know, so while it could be a blue trail, by all measurements, except for one location, and maybe that's at the beginning, maybe it's in the middle, maybe it's in the, in the end. And I think this is where people, like there's a trail where I live, and I've had numerous people tell me, oh, it's rated black, but, but it's, yeah, I think it's a blue trail. But there's a rock roll in the middle of that thing that I'm going to tell you Seven, maybe 75% of the people that ride that trail walk that one particular part, right? And so that defines that rating. Yeah, from a safety perspective, we thought that was the, the safest uh, approach because, again, like I was saying uh, earlier, you cannot rely on the, the end user, especially if it's like a lower uh, spectrum of uh, like beginner or novice biker to 
immediately understand that feature is too much or is more than before or today is wet and this rock is super slippery. Therefore, I just stop and, and walk it. And so this approach that some systems have or some people, I would say, more than some, some systems, uh, that say, oh, it's, it's all green or it's all blue, but it's not really something that we think it's, um, it's appropriate and, uh, and safe for land managers and uh, users. The, the only place where we, we felt that we had to give a little bit of uh, room for adjustment, let's say, was in the, in the technical difficulty uh, overall rating of longer routes because it's not realistic to have uh, a middle to long route that could be, again, sorry for using metric for uh, the listeners that are not familiar with that, but if it's like 20 to 50 kilometers, which is 50K, I think it's around 30 miles probably. We'll, we'll say like that, that, yeah. Yeah, more or less. And have all the trails in that larger loop perfectly at the same tech level, it's probably kind of hard. And oftentimes you have that little stretch of trail or that little passage that is maybe one level higher in terms of how technical it is. And at that point, everything would become like black or double black or orange in the Alps. So we did some simulations of how much time are you willing to walk on a ride that is half a day or two hours or a full day out in the in the backcountry without really impacting your your experience? So we ended up with this rule that I'm reading because uh, I don't want to mess it up. For complete routes or tours, the most difficult trail segments determine the technical difficulty rating if their length in total is longer than five percent of the length of the routes, or at least one of the more difficult segments is longer than 500 meters. So 5% of the total. So that means I had a full day on the bike and I had to walk for 15 minutes spread in two or three spots. That's fine. Uh, I'm okay with it. Ideally, you have signage that informs the user, the next section is more technical or um, things like that. So they know it, but you need a little bit of room for that to work. Otherwise, every destination, and we get back to talking with the tourism uh, agencies, everybody will say, well, we cannot use this system because every route that we have for one reason or another will look much harder than it actually is. So that's the only spot where we put a little bit of like a rubber band <laughs> to make it a little bit, squeeze a little bit and, uh, and fit in something that uh, might have a little bit more than, uh, than the rest of the uh, tech level of the rest of the route. Yeah, and this comes also from the guiding um, experience because normally people are not annoyed if they have to walk a couple of minutes. And so we needed to find out after what amount of time they are annoyed uh, so that you know, well, now on this one, on this route, I'm going to walk too much for my personal feeling. And this is how we came up with that rule. And on the other end of the trail, so actually um, in the ITRS, what we define as a trail doesn't have a rating value. So we chop trails into segments. This is the solution that we do there. This also comes from being in an area where most of the trails were not purposely built for biking. So if I start here on the top of a mountain, I can have five different difficulty levels on my way down. Everything can be in there. So why would you give it one value? Because it's not the reality. In the bike park, if it's nicely done and correctly done, a trail has more or less the same range. Yeah? It should be consistent in itself. So there you don't need this chopping. And uh, I remember that podcast uh, number 77, you discussed about the horse thief bench loop and the drop in into it. And I was lucky to ride it myself nine years back. I don't know how it looks today, but 
you use that as an example. So you have this super nice loop down there, which is something blue, black in North American system. And but to get down there, super gnarly. Yeah? In the ITRS, it would be at the upper end of our black, I would say. Because I could roll everything. I needn't to do didn't need to do crazy stuff, but really high step. And it wouldn't make sense to make the whole loop defined by this thing. Huh? So in the ITRS, we would go and say, well, this drop in there gets a rating black in ITRS. Then the next segment is blue. Then the next segment is red. Then it's blue again. And on the map, digitally or printed, that's easy to display. It's tricky if you want to put a sign up front. Uh, and so we, we are, there we have a little bit of a debate going on how you do the signage. As Eduardo explained, for a whole route, we do this, uh, this rule there. And you could say, well, the horse thief bench thingy, this is a route because it's long enough. So you use this, this rule. But you, if you have one trail that is one kilometer long and it is partially red and partially black, this is a signage discussion in the end that you should have. But um, how we rate it in the ITRS, yeah, we chop it. Huh? And the trail you explained, like everything blue, and then you have this um, steep rock roll. The way we train to deal with such situations for the certified trail raters is, okay, when you realize now it's getting harder in rating, you close the trail segment that you have done. You start a new one, you assess that feature, and a little bit after it, when you realize, hey, it's easier again, you close it. So on the map, you would see a blue line, then maybe 20 meters, don't make it too short. So a little bit before and after that hard feature, you see it's black, and after it, it's blue again. So that's how we want to, and how we're actually dealing with that stuff. While Misha was talking, I was doing some translation in terms of a metric to imperial system. So it's probably easier to understand for people that are not familiar with uh, with kilometers and meters, uh, as I'm not familiar with miles and feet. So in the example that we were do mentioning previously, imagine a loop that is 40 kilometers for zero that translates to 25 miles. And uh, 5% of that is just a little bit more than one mile. So it means that out of a 25 miles loop, you have spread it here and there one mile. There is a little bit more than one mile. There is just a little bit more technical. And the longest section we were mentioning is 500 meters. That's around 1600 feet. So a distance that normally you're like, okay, I'll just walk this, this bit and then you start riding again. Above those numbers, we, we feel that people start to think more about that. So uh, we envision the, the guy that ends up the ride and has a beer with a friend and the friend goes, oh, how was the ride? And if you say awesome, it means that probably you walked less than that 5%. If you say it was horrible, I had to walk half of it. Probably it was not really half of it in terms of distance, but in terms of time that you have spent pushing your bike up or down, probably it was more than what you were happy with. So we landed on, on this uh, 5%. You know, it's, it's interesting because we all take mountain bikes out into the woods so we can roll in that walk, right? And, and, I, and, I've, and again, I think that goes back to ego as well. Sometimes you just have to walk something and sometimes people don't want to, they just don't want to do it. And the reality is, it's like, it's just the way it is. I mean, such a small percentage of people, and we call those people professionals, can roll or jump or whatever means of traversing every single feature of a, tra of a trail can, can, you know, can do that. Like I'm going to say most mountain bikers are that have been doing it for a while are intermediate to advanced at best and or ex yeah, advanced looking at your red circle, red triangle. <laughs> yeah. The, I, for example, uh, I think of trails that are just on the edge of the most technical stuff that I personally can ride. And there are certain sections of them that I know that I'm really at the edge of what I can do uh, with my skill set. I know, for example, that if it's a very wet, rainy, muddy day, there's no way that I'll be able to ride certain sections because I would just risk crashing or crash for sure in some, in some parts. But that's something that comes from like knowing the trail and knowing my skill set and knowing that, okay, today with this bike, maybe with a downhill bike, 
and mud tires, I could be able to clear that section. Uh, but yeah, that's not what I'm riding normally. So yeah, I just walk it. But um, trying to have that, uh, like not to put beginners and intermediate riders in in the situation that they end up in in that uh, spots, we think it's 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 safest for for everybody. Because at the end, and then I switch to the kind of a advocacy experience. Uh, all these people that crash and get injured on bikes in the woods are just bad advertisement for mountain biking in general. And they cause a lot of like headlines on local newspapers. And that's probably one of the reasons that the next time that you go to the mayor of the town or to the park managers and ask them to do some sort of mountain bike friendly trails or do mountain bike related work, they will just start talking about and bringing out those articles about, oh, all these people are getting hurt. So from a perspective, there is not only the rider having fun outside and you could say, well, I don't care if someone gets hurt, they just need to get better. Um, but if they'll decide that mountain biking is too dangerous because too many people get hurt because of multiple reasons, it could be lack of maintenance, it could be lack of signage, then at the end, if the national park decides to ban mountain biking because it's a, too much of a liability, everybody will lose from that. The beginner, but also the super experienced rider that was able to ride everything without any problem, he will not be able to ride that place anymore. So we think that it's very important, even if you just care about yourself to have a good system, you don't want to know, just don't read the signage and ignore it. Uh, but it will help a multiple other users and it will help also yourself at the end, uh, because you'll be able to keep riding because less people getting airlifted out of the woods, uh, with, uh, with bikes, um, it's better for them and, and, and everybody else around them. Yeah. It goes back to providing information so people can make, you know, good decisions, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's also one, like philosophical almost thing that the the position of the itrs is really in a way we inform we do not prescribe so we explain what the challenges are of a trail of a route and then every person has to make the decision okay do i do this or not and you still need to be thinking eh? eduardo touched on the topic of weather conditions i mean how would you uh implement that effect also in the rating system it's just too much i mean you're still in an out of sports so you need to think of it the effect of which bike to take yeah there is kind of a correlation it would make more sense to take x bike on y tray but why why trail but uh, yeah that is your own decision everybody has to do these decisions on their own otherwise it's getting too much or e-bike versus non-motorized yeah okay the endurance rating in the ITRS, just to tell this, this is based on non-motorized bikes. Uh, then we were asked, okay, can't you do one for e-bikes? Oh, wait, how many different battery sizes and powers and what? Okay, no, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we don't need to go down that road too far, but the reality is there's more people on, we can say acoustic bikes, non-motor, non, non, you know, non-pedal assist bikes than there are pedal assist bikes currently. Maybe in 10 or 15 years, if everyone's on a pedal assist bike, it's a different conversation at that point. But at the same time, you just brought up a very good point, which is battery sizes, motors, like there's, there's just a lot of other variables that would need to be taken into consideration. And so there, if you just provide, you know, the known information, which is the length of something, you know, they'll know if they can get through it in their one battery or, or not. Yeah. Or you could also, if you work for a while with the ITRS or say you, you've you been riding a couple of routes uh, which were rated with the ITRS in terms of endurance, you get a feeling what it means for you. Because interestingly enough, another detail of the ITRS not jumping into endurance is we didn't see any system where the amount of downhill meters was taken into account. So, like, for example, the Swiss uh, guiding system, it's like length and uphill. Okay. What are most Swiss riders doing? Hey, I want to have a shuttle day. I'm going to do 5,000 meters vertical down. 
And in that system, it would be, oh, this is not exhausting. Is it? So now the ITRS puts a big factor on the downhill as well. And so that's why you need to get your experience. Okay, if the thing in ITRS is rated red, but I have an e-bike and not acoustic, and you go into the details of the route, you say, oh, it's red, but there's a lot of climbing. Okay, I'm going to do it because uh, I have my um, my motorized bike. So I'm only le fitness level blue, but um, in that case, I, I tackle the red one. Huh? So this is stuff you need to learn in the end. Yeah, talking about bikes, we we stumbled upon that discussion when we mm, we've seen that some systems were using, let's say, discipline specific tech level. Oh, yeah. You could have a green cross country trail and a green downhill trail, and then if you start adding to the equation not only the type of trail but the type of bike that you're using, then do we need like different rating systems for cross country, enduro, downhill? I mean, if it's a purpose built track for one discipline, it could make sense to say this is the downhill track, of course. But if you think of the expanded network where a bike park overlaps with legacy shared use trails, then what do you do? Just put like 10 different signs on the same trail. So if you have a cross country hardtail, it's actually probably red. But if you have a full suspension cross country, then it's this. Then you have an enduro bike. It gets a little bit easier because like it, it's in never end. In gravel, it's it's orange then, of course. Yeah. yeah. The <laughs> and uh, and with e-bikes, it was exactly the same. So you have full power, mid power, less power, more battery, less battery. Like today, it would be almost impossible. And it's something that would be, I would say, impossible to future proof because we have no idea uh, what the bike will look in five or 10 years, especially in the e-bike market where the technology is so fresh. So like 26 inch wheels 29 of course it gets easier with the 29 but if you start like adding that it's endless you have one trail that is still the same and you could go crazy in having 10 or 100 different signs like oh if it's a hard tail electric or and then you can mix all the things it's just so complicated and so useless in our minds at that point the trail is the same and then of course you'll know that Okay, I ride a hardtail for me with my skill set and this bike. That's what I have fun. That's the limit of where I can go. But you need to put a little bit of your own experience into assessing where you want to go. Otherwise, you just hire a guide that knows your skill level and knows the terrain. And then you just follow the guide, which is totally fine. And if you're traveling and you want to make the most out of your riding time, in the woods, that's probably the best approach. So it's perfect. So one one feed that we got from uh, from one guide was like, well, but if we use this everywhere, we'll run out of business. Like, I don't think so. Uh, if your only role is just to avoid that people go in the wrong trail, yeah, that's a part of the job, but that's not all the job. It's just, you need to know Trails that are less busy, you need to know the weather forecast, uh, safety, and uh, some history and of the nature. So guiding is much more than just making sure that people don't get lost. And so a sign in the woods uh, is not replacing the job of guides. We have guides that are attending the, our training and they will, will use this as a new business opportunity for them. So. Let's talk about implementation of this and adoption of it. So, and I should know this, but I don't, which is good because the listeners probably don't know this. Has this been officially adopted within IMBA Europe as your trail rating system currently as of this recording? So with um, IMBA Europe has, has a knowledge uh, sharing hub on, uh, on the website and ITRS is there. So it's one of the documentations that um, IMBA Europe refers to and supports because the, the mission kind of aligns, like we were saying, like more inclusive, um, more mountain bike friendly uh, ways of having pe more people on bikes. Um, so it's it's supported by, by IMBA Europe. It's on their website. And um, we have different countries that are interested in, uh, in using it. 
of course, there are uh, countries that are in an easier place, let's say, to adapt, adopt a new system because they didn't have an official one in place or multiple reasons because, I don't know, the Cycling Federation didn't have one of their own or things like that. And there are other countries where it's a little bit more political and complicated to uh, bring in a new system. Our vision has never been to force anyone to, to use the ITRS. We, we hope that people will see the, the value in it and the value in sharing across borders one system so that people that travel and, uh, and go other places can know what to expect from, from a trail. But aside from that, there are, yeah, different speeds of adoption, let's say, in different countries. Uh, of course, the fact that I'm based in Italy and Misha is based in Switzerland plays a big role in the connections that we have in these countries. So in Italy, there's um, a lot of clubs and, uh, and regions that are uh, adopting it officially in certain projects or just region-wide they have declared uh, that happened in Trento and there are a couple more regions that are heading in the same direction to say all the new projects for mountain biking and gravel uh, signage will need to implement the ITRS. So at least it's avoiding that new projects spend public money in inventing yet again another system or modifying and tweaking that. That's something that happens a lot in Italy existing systems. So you take let's say the Imba US system, and then you change a few things because yeah, why not? And then you just publish the map and say, this is the Imba system. And then you see different colors or different shapes or different ways that it is implemented. And that is even more confusing for the end user because they see a system, but they're like, well, but something doesn't add up. There's a color that shouldn't be there and it adds to the confusion. So uh, having regions and projects more and more that adopt ITRS, uh, we think it's a very good step forward and hopefully we'll have more and more uh, joining the, the team. We, we are there totally realistic. Huh? If you have signage in place or you have a so strong system in place, it's not going to happen overnight. This is a process of many years. In case you, for example, renew a signage in a bike park, that could be a moment to say, okay, I'm going to switch now. The adaptation goes on various levels. So we have a single guiding company somewhere on the world that jumps on it and say, hey, I like that. I um, just use it for my route. Then you have a local bike park here around the corner that's using it. Or like Eduardo said, then the whole region in Italy saying, okay. And so there, for example, Lago di Garda. I don't know if listeners have been to Northern Italy. Lake Garda is quite known for biking. So the tourism office there is implementing the ITRS and they are actually now in talks with us and their plan is to go for a full certified rating of everything they have. So that would be super cool. And above that, there's a province. So they put it into law. And another discussion is going on in Finland where it could come on a national level. So it's, it's free to use. That's very important to, to transmit. So it's free to use. But you should not, you're really not allowed to modify it, that it stays a standard. Uh, so what we always say, but if you want to modify it, let us know. Because if it's for a good reason, we do modify it and everybody else can benefit from it. That's why when you, when you uh, download the full description of the system, you have to leave your contact because we once in a while do an update of the system. What we do not allow actually to explain this people that were not trained by us do trainings because we want, of course, to have a centralized knowledge hub. Now we need to have training over here. Uh, trail building companies, like I said earlier, should have a person on staff that, that understands this, especially, and I don't know what the, what the appetite for this is in Europe and other parts around, of, around the world, but you know, we have new, brand new trail systems getting built here in the States whether it's a cross country system or a gravity system, like that's the perfect time to implement. This is when it's, when it's brand new, there's no, there's no legacy of, of, of trails. There's no legacy of signage. There's no legacy of use. We're still pretty early on in terms of the age of mountain biking and where we are as an activity relative to many other activities, most closely 
we'll say Alpine sports, right? They have like a hundred years or more on us. Yeah, you're very welcome to come to the next training, which is scheduled for the mid of November or anybody else who's listen, listening to it. We have a website for the ITRS and there are all the links that you need. And at some point, as said, uh, the more interest there is, uh, the more it makes sense also to do the trainings at a different location. Of course, it's always a bit of work to set up these trainings because we have to define a test route. We, and this to construct such, such a test route has certain um, like demands that normal routes don't have because we need to have every nasty thing which is tricky to decide of the IHRS in such a test route. So you need to go there a couple of days in advance, find these things and rate it and so on. Yeah, more than welcome to come along. And I have one question for you, maybe just, but yeah, you had a- I was going to ask where that training is. Yeah, this training is in Switzerland, where I'm based in, in Valle. So it's, of course, when you come um, from far away, you, you should combine it with a riding trip. I mean, the village where I am based, we are um, hosting it here. It's called FISP. Nobody will know about it, but you may have seen the last UCI World Cup races um, for Montana for the cross country. It's like uh, half an hour to the west. Uh, Alec Arena for the Enduro uh, is half an hour to the east. Then Zermatt with the Matterhorn. This is uh, one hour to the south. So it's not a bad place to be for biking. Doesn't sound like a bad place to be for biking at all, especially if it's hosting world cu- or world class events. Yeah, no. It, ah, next year the world championships uh, for all mountain biking disciplines will be here as well. So you were going to ask me a question. Yeah, it was um, because we are having some headaches um, about exactly this discrepancy of colors for the North American system and the European system. We have uh, those headaches internally. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, would you think it's feasible to switch to this color code with having your North American color code so well established, meaning like this green, blue, black, double black? If you would really switch it to this European thing, would you think it's feasible? Because there could be other options to do that. Huh? So I'm going to answer that question with a question. I'm going to throw out the word, the word trail forks. Trail forks, at least from what I can tell, is maybe the most universally used mapping system currently. Yeah. How how it got there, I have no idea. It maybe because it's the most I mean, I from a from a user perspective, it seems to be the easiest to use. You know, we all, there's also another map online mapping system called MTB Project. As I don't know how common that is in Europe. For me in the States, when I tried to add my, you know, add or modify trails within my local system. To MTB project, it was virtually impossible. I had to try to get a hold of somebody, explain to them what was going on. I couldn't just give, I couldn't, you know, just add, upload GPS tracks to get them approved. So it, it just was super, super difficult to deal with. And so maybe that's why Trail Forks has become so simple or it's somewhat, not simple, so universally accepted. And so I look at this and I actually like that there is five colors or five names for those that are colorblind of being beginner, intermediate, advanced, expert, and extreme. And so if you're asking me personally, I could, I think this is really a very, a good place for us to go. I'm sure if you ask 10 people, you might get 10 answers. Hopefully seven of those 10 would be the same, but yes, I, I like, I like the red being in the middle and not being on one end. And here in the States, Orange is typically, and you kind of talked about this early on, orange is most commonly associated with, with bike park specific ratings, you know, and, and what I mean by bike park is really purpose-built features, jumps, drops, gaps, you know, all the different things that you find constructed specifically for mountain biking. And that was adapted really from winter systems, where if you go to a winter, we'll say terrain park, you know, at a purpose-built ski resort where you have, you know, maybe a half pipe quarter pipe rails jumps you know that that orange i'm going to say the orange pill because it's oval shaped kind of like a pill you know that that came over from from that system initially initially at least to my best knowledge 
Yeah, we've we've been in talks with um, the staff of uh, Trail Forks years ago about uh, having them adopt ITRS, at least in some regions in Europe to start with. And the feedback from them was very positive because one issue that we have in Europe is that depending on how active is the regional um, administrator, administrator, thank you, you could end up having trails uploaded by users in the same region. And one was using the Imba US and one was using the Forestry UK system. And that translated in the fact that once you were looking at the map, you could see two red lines, but one meant double black and the other meant European red, so less than black. Uh, and that was very confusing for users and Trailforks knew that that was an issue. So the first feedback was, we really like the system. It would be very cool for us and actually kind of easy to implement, at least the descriptions at the beginning. So users know where to refer to have an in-depth description of the levels. And then it's easier to like describe what is blue instead of just people just shouting, it's blue. But they then you ask them, so how much is the step height that it needs to be in a blue trail? Of course, they have no idea. Sadly, soon after those initial calls, they got acquired by outside and at that point, uh, we kind of really struggled to have um, feedback from them again. We we have the impression that they had to focus on the U.S. North America market, and so all the European stuff got like put on pause for for a little bit. But we really hope that we'll be able at some point to to have them on board uh, again, so that we can keep that discussion going. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned mountain bike project because, and you asked how uh, how used it is in Europe. I think that in Italy there are probably four trails uploaded, which I did a few years ago, and um, I was looking into that because at the beginning Imba was involved in mountain bike project, and the the cool thing about behind that project is that if you upload a track, you need to show proof that that's an illegal mountain bike trail that you're you have uploaded a trail where it's uh, it's okay to ride on. And of course, that requires having context maybe with a land manager and uploading a lot more documentation. So the tracks that you find at the end are much higher quality, I would say. You're 100% sure that that's stuff that has been vetted by someone in, uh, in the company. But the problem is that you need a even larger determination and number of users that upload stuff and in in Europe, it never took off because one thing is to just upload a file and try to understand a few things in a foreign language and then hit save. One thing is if you get an email in English and English is not your native language, asking for land manager, paperwork and stuff like that. Most people, at least in Italy, will really struggle in understanding what they have to like submit and what kind of paper they need to get. And so it, it, it was not working, at least uh, here. I'm not sure the situation in other parts of Europe, but yeah, it was too complicated. Yeah, my, my situation specifically was, it was difficult to communicate with the person on the other end. They're very non-responsive. And so as a local administrator for Trail Forks, and at one point, the trail coordinator for the local trail organization, I could have demonstrated the qualifications necessary that, you know, these trails were indeed legal, open to the public, the the actual current GPS track, but I couldn't really communicate with the person because they were just non-responsive. So I just gave up. Yeah, we would really be happy if um, the ITRS in the end is used on all kinds of levels. So on the official side, somebody that really wants to have a certified rating, but also just by bikers and just uh, on platforms like I agree with you for trail forks. It seems to be now also in Europe getting more and more traction here it seems to be the tool that is used that trails there are rated according to ITRS. We have a Swiss admin who's actually a fan of the ITRS and he also tries to, via his influence, uh, to make it possible, um, find ways that, that that's the way. In the moment, the in Europe you have, as Eduardo mentioned, a system by Forestry UK, which has the same colors and symbols as the ITRS. And 
we of course did this for a reason. Yeah, as I said, we didn't want to invent something new. One would actually just need to switch the description of the levels behind it, because most of the ratings are anyway not certified and not precise. So it's clear over time things will change, but you would have a starting position. So here in Switzerland, every trail was switched into Elfworks to that UK system, just like by a simple translation from North America to UK. Right. So at least there was one step done. Well, and there's one other aspect that we haven't touched on, not only, and we're not, we, we're not going to solve this problem, at least in a podcast, is, you know, from a, a risk management perspective in terms of liability and insurance, and that is obviously different across, I mean, here in the States, it's different across state lines. It's got, it's, it's a whole different, you know, thing when you start talking about different countries and what different, you know, laws are that dictate some liabilities. But at the most basic level, if we're all talking the same language, which is what ITRS is talking about here and how things are being rated, I would, I would imagine that from a bike park perspective, and I mean gravity bike park perspective, like a pay to play lift service type of perspective, and even from a municipality or government uh, public municipal system perspective, if we're all using the same language in terms of how a trail is in terms of its, for its characteristics, it should make things a lot easier in that world. Yeah, absolutely. If you then add the, um, the tool that we developed, this trail rating app, as like your means of standard and your means of documentation, because as a, we also got the, got the discussion, well, if I rate a trail, am I going to be liable in the end if somebody crashes on it? So, well, you, it, we didn't solve all the legal stuff around it, definitely, but we always try to make it work out in respect of liability questions. So what we say is as a trail writer, you are liable to make the correct decision about the difficulty of the trail at the point in time you are doing it. So with the app, you get a timestamp and it's mandatory to take a picture of the stuff that you rate. By this, you can later on demonstrate, I've been there, it looked like that. That's all I can do. If the land manager didn't do proper maintenance and the thing looks different, this is not the responsibility of the trail rater. So we also, next to the common language, hope that by this kind of common practice and documented practice, you also have an advantage in discussing these topics. Yeah, and I think having a third party actually looking at it so it's not based on the local, you know, it's, a, it's, it's essentially based on somebody coming in with fresh eyes, right? And I think that's probably the, the best way to go because you don't, have, you don't have preconceived biases towards something. And you can take ego out, out of the equation, hopefully. Well, yeah, the, the, the app takes ego quite a lot out of the equation. You, you really need to cheat like hell. To, because you cannot down downrate huh? the app. If you enter, this is a grade. It tells you it's minimum red, for example. You cannot go down. There's no way. You can always go up because you'll say, well, in context and everything. But then you will really need to cheat. And if then uh, there's a problem, you will be in problems because then you go there. Well, the trail is actually 30%. And it's unlikely that one year ago it was 10%. That is very unlikely. You can change the surface, you can change the features, you can yeah. change the width. You typically, it's, t it's a lot more difficult to change the slope without changing the actual full alignment of the trail. Yeah, yeah. So I just mean, and normally, uh, you, you, you would need to have criminal energy yeah, to make a wrong rating in the thing in terms of rating it too low. That's clear. Yeah. It doesn't work. Well, before we wrap this thing up, I always ask my guests what they look for in a trail community. So I'm going to ask Misha first, like what are the things you look for in a good trail community? And I want you to answer selfishly, you know? So if you had to say you had to move to a new, new place or you wanted to move to a new place or you couldn't stay where you at, you are at, what are the things that you'd be looking for in a trail community that speak to you? Okay. Selfishly, I would say it should look like where I am at. And I love it because um, we have, by law, the right, the right, it's allowed to write any trail that not has an explicit forbidden sign. 
and we are talking about thousands of kilometers of hiking trails in Valais. We have public transport that takes bikes. So we can go up with a bus, take the bike on the mountain and ride down. So to say, have really good access, trails close to home, and um, really the, the, the right to use them is for me perfect. And what I know even more of, um, because most of this stuff is like legacy trails, how you call it, so more on the technical side, we have no creative trail builders here that build stuff uh, that are really exciting, um, mixing in jumps with tech stuff and so on, and doing a big mashup. And uh, I, I love that stuff. So if I would move somewhere else, um, what I would add to the mix, yeah, a seashore, because we don't have that here. How would climate change that might happen at some point? We don't need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Eduardo? Talking about me and myself, well, I would love to, uh, in my dreams, move to a place that has a vibrant, inclusive mountain bike community that uh, is able to not only do maintenance of the trails, but engage with uh, with other, other users. Um, I see a lot the issues of not having a maintenance plan on, on my local trails and the fact that different groups do different maintenance work without any sort of coordination. And at the end, it's not fun to ride the trails as a mountain biker. It's not fun to hike them as a hiker. And everybody's just blaming the other side for issues that could be easily solved uh, working together, but uh, that sadly is not often the case. So I would love to see that happen here or in the ideal place where we're heading. Well, it sounds like once you get the international trail riding system completely developed and you know moving on its own, your next task will be to solve trail maintenance. And I'm just going to throw it out there: if you think it was a difficult a task to solve the trail riding systems, good luck. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, um, we try to um, sneak it in there huh? with this destination certificate. The destination only gets that certificate if they do maintenance. So we hope that even there we, we get a start on it. Yeah, <laughs> that's super important. You know, I mean, the, the trail maintenance topic has come up so many times with this podcast. And then on top of that, it comes up so many times outside of the podcast because I have people emailing me asking about how to create a trail maintenance plan or how to implement trail maintenance. You know, you talk about it in different ways with, with, you know, professionally with clients that are asking, you know, for new trail, but you want to provide them with new trail, but they're really only the way that the only way that new trail is going to be successful if is if there's maintenance after the fact, you know, we've gotten into this, we've gotten into using the word sustainable trails in a lot of things, but the reality is nothing is truly sustainable in terms of like not needing maintenance. The most bulletproof things still need main maintenance to some level, correct? Yeah, we yeah, hope absolutely. that uh, with the certification um, for destinations, we we inspire. Let's say uh, we don't. I don't want to say force destinations that uh, are interested in just a shiny badge to understand that. Yeah, the shiny badge could be useful. The signage is very useful, of course, but that's not the end. That's the start of of the journey. If you don't have a maintenance plan and a trained crew that will take care of the trails, you will end up having shiny signage that points into a trail that is all closed by the vegetation and eroded by water. And again, that's not the end goal because you cannot have fun on that trail either, either if you're like hiking or, or, or cycling. So. Well, I think at the end of the day, you know, Throughout this whole conversation, although we didn't say these words once, it all boils down to having and providing a good user experience, correct? You know, and that's the, that's the end game for all of this. Was there anything, uh, Misha, that we didn't discuss that you want to bring up before we close this one out officially? No, I think they touched on many points. It was really cool. So, yeah. And yeah, if you have us on a campfire, yeah, you, you should shut us down at some point, but, uh, uh, so we could talk, of course, even more, but I enjoyed it really a lot. Thank you. It's, I think it's this, this ends up being a good medium for getting, you know, 
good dialogue going between between people and then sharing that obviously with everyone that listens to it. Eduardo, did you bring yeah. any is there any topics on your end that we didn't talk about that you wanna slide in before we close this one out? No, I think uh it's been pretty extensive uh chat on the on the topic and yeah, we could take a lot of different more in depth discussions on many aspects, but I think that uh it's uh it's been great and there's a lot of uh, food for thoughts and hopefully we've been able to explain a little bit more how uh, how we came to where we are and what's been the work behind the scenes of uh, ITRS. I really appreciate Misha, you reaching out and both of you, Misha and Eduardo, you know, being open to having this conversation. I think it's the only way you continue to share knowledge is to have conversations like this. And so I really appreciate the time you've invested into both this podcast, but also on a, on a larger scale, the time you've invested into creating the system because it, it is needed. And so thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please take the time to share these shows with others. Sharing these shows will help create awareness of both the guests who have taken the time to be on the show and the podcast series itself. Also, if you're new to the Trail Effect podcast, check out our ever-expanding library of episodes. If you listen to the Trail Effect podcast on Apple or Spotify, please don't forget to leave a rating and review, as this is one of the best ways to show your support for the Trail Effect podcast. Also, don't forget to check out Cooley Creative at www.dojustsendit.com. For additional ways to help support the Trail Effect podcast, check out the affiliate links tab at the Trail Effect website, where you'll find links to Kettle Mountain Apparel, Worldwide Cyclery, and Trail One Components. By using the affiliate links found at www.traileffectpodcast.com, a small commission will come back to the podcast, which will help keep this thing going. This podcast has been edited and produced by Evolution Trail Services. Thank you again for listening.